guys can ask questions, but um, been pleased so far. You know, with camp, obviously, over the last probably three years, there's been a bunch of rule changes that have affected how we do camp. Um, no two a days anymore. Um, you know, days off. Bunch of rules that have changed really kind of the feel of camp. Um, and then obviously at Penn State with the academic uh, calendar that we have. Um, you know, our guys typically go to school for most of camp as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's gone well. You know, Manny's done a really good job coming in and, and getting adjusted. Um, obviously, the time that we spent at the retreat, kind of going through how we do things, how we operate, uh, not only from a daily schedule, but also from a philosophical perspective, I think that's been, uh, I think that's been helpful. Uh, obviously, year two with Coach Yursich has, has been helpful as well. And then continuing to build in, in the area on special teams with, with Stacy. Um, been pleased with all those things. I, like, I, like I said, at media days, I think we have more depth you know, than we've had the last two years uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, but overall, I'm pleased, obviously, the positions that you, know, you guys have written about already, that we, we have some depth or some question marks. Um, you know, we're working hard, obviously, to build those, you know, build that depth at those positions as well. So, uh, overall, really good. You know, you guys will get a chance to see us this afternoon, you know, briefly, and then, um, you know, we're also talking about, you know, uh, some other opportunities. So we'll see how that all plays out. But appreciate everybody coming out to cover Penn State football. Look forward to uh, answering your questions and looking forward to working with you guys all year long. So open up the questions. Raise your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. Uh, Dave, no? Hey, James. Uh, I'm Zach Allen from the Daily Collegian. Hey, Zach. Uh, Parker Washington's entering his third year with the team. What's it been like to see him go from a true freshman uh, to one of the leaders um, in the wide receiver group um, and a potential number one option? Yeah, you know, he's, he's done a nice job, obviously. You know, being with Jahan, I think, was helpful for him in his development and seeing the things that Jahan did. Um, and he's obviously made you know, a number of plays here. Um, you know, really good ball skills, great body control, and, you know, really intelligent guy. Um, so, you know, I know Sean has a lot of confidence in him, and, and so does Coach Yursich and Coach Stubblefield and myself as well. Um, I think he's going to have a big year for us, and obviously we need him to have a big year. You know, obviously I don't – I wouldn't necessarily say at this at this stage, um, you know, that – when you have a first round draft choice at the wide receiver position, that one person, although I think Jahan could do it and, and so could some other guys. Um, but I do feel like the group has the ability um, to match or exceed the production from the wide receiver unit last year. Now, whether it's a one for one trade off, I'm not sure, but I think um, you know, if you look at the group last year and where Keandre, I think, is going to be this year. And then the production that Mitch Tinsley's had in his career, and obviously Parker, we feel really good about that group. And then the other thing I think is important um, is that next that next unit. You know, that again, the depth at that position, um, I, the depth is not even close compared to to, to last year. Um, there was a significant drop off if you know if we got into the second team guys last year, and I don't I don't think that's the case this year. So that'll be important, and obviously Parker. Parker will provide a, uh, a huge role there from a leadership and from a production standpoint. John? You mentioned question marks. What are your biggest question marks heading into the season, and, and are you close to filling those at this point? Well, <clears throat> you know, if you, if you start on, on special teams, um, you know, Stout did such a good job, um, you know, and obviously ended up getting drafted. Uh, that's that's a concern. You know, obviously, pinnegar has been a starter here before. Um, I feel like we have some really good options at kickoff. Um, but punt, you know, on special teams is probably the, the biggest question. You know, Barney and Moore is leading, leading the pack right now. Um, but Stout did such a good job. The other thing you hope, obviously, is you don't, you don't punt as much. That would, that would help solve that problem a little bit, too. Um, and then when you talk about, you know, on, on defense, you know, I would say it's at, at middle linebacker um, and maybe linebacker in general, but specifically middle linebacker. But I do think 
uh, right now, Elsden and Kobe, um, you know, have done a really nice job there. Um, I think that's a legitimate competition. Uh, and I think we feel good about how those guys are operating the defense right now. You know, and, and then the other thing, and I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this or not, but we, we started Wiley there um, and wasn't really sure because he, in a lot of ways, he was pretty much a defensive end in high school. Um, but he's super smart uh, and seems to be handling it really well. So, um, you know, that, that's probably the biggest question mark that I would say we have on defense. Obviously, figuring out who the other safety is going to be, um, but we feel like we got a number of really good options. You know that are that are competing there uh, on offense. You know it's it's been the offensive line. You know for a couple of years. So again, I'm not going to sit here and, and pound the table about this is the year. Um, you know because that that hasn't necessarily played out the way the last couple of years. So um, you know uh, I'm going to I'm going to take a more measured approach there and, and, and let, let them and let us prove that to you um, along the offensive line. And then obviously, you know, based on, again, production, you know, between the O-line and the running backs, the running game in general um, will probably be another question mark. But, you know, we've ha we, you know, we have different people in that room. We've got some guys returning and, and, and some new faces in that room that's created really good competition and depth. Um, I think the biggest thing is is potential for big plays in the running game. Um, that's that's going to be really important for us. You know, your numbers are always going to be impacted if you don't have any of those long runs. Um, you know, to affect not only field position but also the you know averages. Um, and then I think that's also plays a role in taking some pressure off of the passing game and should create some more big play potential off a of play action pass as well. So those are the things that probably uh, jump out to me as the most, if that, if that makes sense. Dave? Hi, James. Hey, Dave. Um, I've had too much time on my hands during the summer and overanalyzing everything. And uh, it occurred to me, you guys, you guys are known for self-analyzing and being a big fan of self-study, self reverse engineering problems. And it, it occurred to me that every single, in eight years, every single one of your position groups has not been just at a good level, but at one time or another, a superior level, except for one, which is the offensive line, as, as you said. Why? Why do you think that is? Is it development, coaching, recruiting? Why? Yeah, I think, I think you got to say all of that, right? Um... You know, I think you get to an elite level or a superior level um, through all of those things. Um, and when it doesn't work out the way you want it to, then all those areas factor in as well. So that's where some of the changes that we've made it, you know, from a staff perspective, um, I think are going to impact that. Uh, philosophically, how we've kind of gone about our business in terms of off-season development, strength and conditioning, um, some of the things that we're doing scheme-wise as well um, that I've been adamant about um, that I think are going to help that position as well. Um, it's all of it. It's scheme, it's fundamentals, it's coaching, um, it's recruiting. Uh, it's it's all of it. I, I think all of it is impacted, and and when we're successful, um, it's for the very same reasons. You know, to to your to your point, um, you know, it's hard to say when when you win a Big Ten championship that you you know you didn't play well. So I don't know if I completely agree with your analysis, but 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 I think it's a fair point. Yeah, I, I think, again, I think it's a, it's a fair question, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed right away with Manny is we are emphasizing turnovers like crazy. And because of that, you see it. I just literally just said that in a staff meeting this morning. We're getting our hands on so many more balls, fumbles, turnovers. So I think your point is a good one. I will tell you this year, um, it's been emphasized. I've felt like that in the past as well. Um, but it's been 
it's been emphasized uh, enough that we have the chance to, to take a step in the right direction this year. Um, but I do think there's some things that we've done off the field as well from a staffing perspective um, that I think can impact it. And then I think you have to be willing to call the game in a certain way as well. There's, there's things that you can do uh, to help with the offensive line. There's, there's things that you can do in terms of, again, the running game, you know, being able to wear people down on normal downs on first and second down, take some of those, uh, those shots off your quarterback, but also to wear down the defense alignment so not as effective on third down, being able to move the pocket so you don't have a consistent launch point, doing things with your cadences, um, all those things. But again, I think it's, I think it's a more than fair question. Um, I am confident that it has been emphasized this training camp and off season. Hey, James, you, uh, you mentioned Manny. Um, I'm wondering how much of a different philosophy uh, are you going to have defensively this year compared to working with Brent for all those years? I know you wouldn't want to get into specific things, yep. but is it a dramatic change or is it more subtle? No, I think it's more subtle. And again, that, that's why we went in that direction, right? You know, um, at the end of the day, we were going to try to go out and hire the best defensive coordinator we possibly could. But being able to find someone that comes from a similar background, similar philosophy, um, I think was is helpful. You know, you just you just don't want to start all over again, um, especially when you think about it. Um, you know, the majority of the players are back, and majority of the staff were back. So, um, who's going to take on that learning? Is it is it all the players, or, or it is the coordinator? So, I think we've done a, a pretty good blend there. But at the end of the day. You also have hired Manny for a reason, and you want him to be comfortable in what he's doing and what he's calling and, and how he operates. Um, but I think we're in a I think we're in a good place. I've been I've been pleased with how we've played defensively. Um, I love what you know Manny's doing in terms of what I just talked about in terms of how he's emphasizing you know getting your hands on on ball in terms of calls and fumbles. Um, interceptions, true interceptions, or tip tip balls that turn into interceptions, getting guys to run to the ball. So, you know, I've been I've been I've been very pleased, and I think our guys are confident. And there's some subtle changes um, that I think fit who we are. Corey, hi James. With regards to Mike Yurcich, you mentioned a couple minutes ago you have to be willing to call the game a certain way. What do you think Mike learned last year in terms of his development? calling games in the Big Ten, what will work, what won't work, those kinds of things? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is him knowing our personnel and what those guys do well um, and where we need to help them, you know. And, and again, that's in the running game. That's specifically with Sean. You know, I think him, Sean and Mike uh, know each other better, and I think that's useful. Obviously, like we've talked about, you know, having the, the same offensive coordinator and the same offensive system for multiple years. Um, I think there's there's a ton of value in that. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the other thing is is just the familiarity with the league, with the defensive coordinators, uh, with the venues, all, all those things, I think, are, are helpful. So, you know, obviously, Mike's got a long track record of success and um, you know, again, I think we have the ability to do some pretty good things on offense this year with a returning starting quarterback, the personnel, and the coordinator. Rich, good afternoon. How are you? Good, Rich. How are you? I'm good, thanks. You got received substantial production from the transfer portal last year. What do you expect from Mitchell, Chop, and Hunter from the D1 transfers that you have? How and how have they acclimated themselves here? Yeah, I think you know, Mitch. You know, it just had has already had so much production um, in college, and he's he's super mature, um, and he also understands some of the some of the things that maybe the young guys don't understand. You know, he's roommates with Sean. Smart move. You know, um, they've they've been able to really build a rapport together on and off the field, which which I think is really helpful. Um, so I think I think he's got a chance to have a, a really, really productive year. Um, kind of all the things we talked about is kind of how he is as a player. He's dependable. Um, he's got really good ball skills and toughness and maturity. So I think he's one of those guys that 
you're going to know what you're getting pretty much week in and week out from him. Um, you know, you, you, if you talk about Hunter, you know, obviously the closer you get to the ball, just like, you know, if you're a, if you're a freshman coming in, um, you know, the, the, the transfer situation, especially when you're transferring from whether it's Ivy League or one double A up or whatever it may be, it's a big difference. Um, you know, uh, blocking PJ Mustafer and Hakeem Beeman is very different than what he's had to consistently block uh, in Ivy League. So that transition has gone um, well. But I, I will say, you know, you look at his testing numbers, he's, he's tested extremely well. He is fast, like really fast, um, explosive and strong, and obviously um, intelligent. So, we have better depth up front than we've had in the last couple of years. Um, you know, so whether it's game one or game four, you know, we'll we'll see. But he's going to have a significant role. Um, but it but it's too early to to say right now. Um, you know, who and and how it's gonna how it's gonna play out. And then the other one is chop. Um, you know, at defensive end, that was something that was going to be important to us obviously with the guys that we lost you know AK and then you know obviously the what we did with Jesse last year you know we needed we needed to make sure that we got somebody that could come in as well as developing the guys who are on our roster that could take the next step get Adisa back helps too um, he was a significant loss for us last year um, but we've been pleased with them you know um, I think the way we practice um, you know the type of physicality that we have at practice every single day, also the way we're using him. He was really a 3-4 outside linebacker, and there's a lot of similarities between a 3-4 outside linebacker um, uh, you know, and a 4-3 defensive end, depending on how you, how you operate your scheme and how you're using that outside linebacker. Um, but it, but it, is, it is a little bit different for him. Um, you know, having his hand in the ground pretty much every single play and having to go against them offensive tackles pretty much every single play. But he is quick and explosive and fast and, and has flashed several times, not only you know, sitting in the defensive meetings, but the offensive coach is talking about him as well. So um, you know, we, we feel really good about all three of those guys having, having a role for us. Uh, we'll see how significant that role is you know, as camp and, and the season, as the season progresses. Audrey. Hey, James. Good afternoon. Hey, Audrey. Get a new watch? I'm sorry? Is that a new watch you have? Watch. Looks like a new watch. Oh, I thought you said wash. No, um, watch. watch. Looks, no, uh, yeah. my daughter Addison gets gets me a watch. She got me that maybe a year or two okay. ago, uh, every couple of years for the season. I, just, I didn't recognize it, that's why. Um, with regards to USC and UCLA joining the Big Ten, do you recall when you first heard of that or what you were doing, and do you think there could be any benefit recruiting-wise for you guys with that expansion down the road? Yeah, uh, Pat gave me a call. Um, it was either a day or two before it was announced uh, publicly. Um, so that was good to kind of have that conversation. And, you know, I think, you know, I read some things and, and, and heard some things at Big Ten Media Days and other things where I don't know if that was the case everywhere in the league. So that was, that was great to be able to have that conversation uh, and be prepared for it. And then the other thing, um, you know, when you ask about about recruiting, yeah, I think obviously when when you're able to add two teams from from California uh, to your conference, um, that should allow you to maybe get into some conversations um, that maybe you haven't been able to get into before, um, you know, from that region. Um, you know, obviously, not having an international airport here in town. Um, um, Know, has some has somewhat of an impact on that, but yeah, I think it. You know, you look at this recruiting class. I think we're we're recruiting more nationally. We've talked about some of those things specific to the state of Pennsylvania and specifically to the Northeast um, that you're going to have to take that approach. Um, but also, you know, but also, you know, your point is when you add two two universities and two schools like that to the conference. Um, it should create some more opportunities, you know, for kids that, um, you know, obviously we're going to go out there for a couple games, uh, and they're going to be obviously coming to us a lot. So um, I, I think it, it it's going to have to. Neil. Hey James. Hey Neil. 
Um, has there been much uh, ongoing discussion with Sean and the leadership uh, team about what came up about a month ago concerning uh, improved benefits at Penn State and Big Ten college football? And have you had to uh, address uh, the overall focus with the team? Are you satisfied with, with where the focus is? No, I, I think, you know, obviously there was a ton of conversations, but, you know, once training camp has started, uh, no. And, and, you know, we obviously addressed this at Big Ten Media Days. Obviously, we knew that was going to be a, you know, topic and a conversation uh, piece. But, um, no, you know, we had a bunch of conversations. But now that training camp has started, uh, I, I've seen everybody locked in and loaded and focused, uh, very similar to the responses that we had at Big Ten Media Days. Todd? Hey, Coach. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, I was talking to Jair at Indianapolis about the defensive backfield, and he was really impressed, obviously, with the, the amount of guys, the skill set, that type of deal. But he also said how physically ready the players are to get on the field and just get going. Can you talk about what that competition has looked like in the defensive backfield? It's obviously been a position you've recruited heavily. Is it where you want it to be, and what does it allow you to do schematically to have a lot of big bodies or just a lot of bodies in the backfield defensively? Yeah, I do think if you look, you know, um, you know, at Penn State historically, you know, if, I don't know if you guys have been in the facility in, in a while, but outside of each one of our rooms, um, meeting rooms, we kind of have all the players that uh, were all Americans or first round draft choices or whatever it was. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Coach Poindexter, but really specifically Terry Smith, um, you look at the number of guys that have made all conference, uh, all American, and been drafted out of the defensive back room. Uh, I think that's been a real emphasis and probably a shift historically in, in what we've been able to do there. Um, and, and Terry gets a lot of credit for that. Um, you know, but when you when you look at where we're at right now, you know, you talk about depth at the corner position. You know, we're really in a, in a pretty good spot there. One of the guys that's really come on for us right now is having a great camp is Johnny Dixon. Um, has, had, has had a really good camp, um, which, which is really important for us, not only in creating depth, but also um, guys that, you know, maybe people have pegged in as the starters um, are either being pushed to improve their game to keep their starting job um, you know, or, or could be replaced. And that's, that's kind of across the board. Um, but when you talk about, you know, Marquise Wilson's played a lot of football, Johnny Dixon's played a lot of football, Kalen King's played a lot of football, Porter and Hardy have all played a lot of football. And then the young guys that you add to that, you know, that, that helps. You know, especially as much nickel as we may play, you know, Hardy's done a tremendous job in that role. Um, and I could see him taking the next step there, um, but, has, but has made some big plays and has really taken ownership of that spot. You know, and then in the back end, you know, it's kind of similar. You know, obviously Tig's a guy, Jair, uh, Tig's a guy that, you know, obviously has established himself last year, you know, tied for the league, excuse me, tied, tied for the um, lead in interceptions nationally. Uh, but there's three other guys that, that we feel really good about, you know, that are that are competing for that other spot. When you talk about Ellis, who's played a lot of football for us, Jalen Reed, who played for us last year as a true freshman, and then Zachy Wheatley, who last year we redshirted at the corner position and then moved to safety in the spring. Uh, let alone the guys that that are coming in. Um, so that that's been that's been really good competition. Um, and seeing those guys work on the back end and gain confidence. And again, I think the way Manny and, and Dex and, and Terry are emphasizing uh, the turnovers and the tip passes and, and the caused fumbles. The interesting thing is I think that's really going to help our defense. But that ball security um, also impacts our offense every single day. If that ball's not high and tight and, and put to the sideline, there's somebody going after it every single day, and that's that's in the air as well. So I think it it helps our defense, but it also has an impact on helping our offense. Ben, hey James, how's it going? Good, Ben. How are you? Good. I know Mark's going to time me, so I got to do this quickly. Um, I'm just letting the seconds go. There's an athletic department has a finite number of people around it at any given moment that have the resources that you need to make the advancements 
from the business perspective, from the infrastructure perspective, when you've been around for a long time, you start to have relationships with these people that go one way or the other. What are the challenges that you face at this point almost you know, we'll round up and say 10 years into being at the same place when it comes to NIL, when it comes to the business perspective and sort of cultivating the things that you need from those people. From the people that you're saying that have been here for 10 years and those types of relationships you're talking about? Yeah, outside of the program. I mean, we're talking about money, basically. Gotcha. Yeah, I think those things really matter, and I think those things really help. Um, to have those type of relationships that you can pick up the phone, uh, that you can explain, you know, a topic um, that maybe is new to college football, new to college athletics, um, and, and get people not only to understand but to buy into it. Um, and then I think also to your point, you know, when you talk about facilities, really specifically to how Penn State um, how we do facilities here in terms of, of raising, raising the money, the majority of the money before the project happens, um, those, things are, those things are important as well. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, being able to use a, um, a letterman or a donor's house in town for recruiting purposes, whether it's people donating to the university um, for scholarships, whether it's donating to the facility, excuse me, to the, to the university for facilities. Um, that's not only athletics, that's, that's across the board uh, at the university, or whether it's people, um, you know, getting behind, you know, the NIL initiatives that are obviously um, all over college athletics and specifically college football. I think those, those relationships are critical. Now, the thing that's also, you know, fascinating at, at a place like Penn State is, um, and I think some of the, the, you know, the NIL conversations that are going on is at a school as big as Penn State and with the number of alumni and lettermen we have, there's still plenty of opportunities out there. And that's one of the things that's been interesting is I think you have to be careful uh, when you're talking about fundraising of going back to the same donors over and over again. Uh, those people are critical and, and we're super appreciative of them. But what this has done, it is, it is really opened some um, opportunities and avenues to maybe people that hadn't been giving uh, to Penn State for whatever reason uh, that now are. So, um, you know, we've taken an active role in this as well. And, um, you know, I've been pleased. But I do think, you know, your point is a good one. I, I, met, I went and met with a bunch of uh, gentlemen in the Wilkes-Barre area, um, you know, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen up in the Wilkes-Barre area. And that was one of the things that they talked about. You know, I remember at the end of the meeting, you know, one of the gentlemen made a statement, you know, you know, we, we like consistency, you know, at, at Penn State. Um, you know, so I do think your, your point is, is a good one. Um, you know, those relationships in anything are critical, but, you know, in the area that you asked about, it's, it's, it's very important. We have time for two more questions, Allie, and then uh, we'll come over to Pat. Hey, James, how's Hi, your family? Allie. Good, Allie, how are you? Good. Late September, team was 4-0, 5-0. We had a big conversation about complacency and, and trying to make sure that guys weren't buying into the hype too much or reading too much of what was out there. College football seems to have more eyes on it than ever, more pressure with NIL and opportunities to go get your own media exposure. How do you avoid that complacency if, if things start going really well here at the beginning uh, of, of guys kind of buying in too much to the hype? Well, I think in general, uh, whether it's last year or your your point about, you know, um, making sure guys are staying grounded and, and staying focused, I think that's where depth is is really important. Um, you know, whether you have an injury or whether you have a guy that that is, that is struggling um, or not playing the way they're capable of playing, having a legitimate option right behind them uh, tends to solve those problems, you know, pretty fast. Um, so, you know, working extremely hard, um, you know, under the current college football model, you could make the argument that it may be harder than it's ever been to manage your roster unless you're willing to live and die in the transfer portal. Um, and, and for us, you know, at this stage of the game, 
you know, we're looking at the transfer portal probably in a way like a lot of schools 15 years ago used to look at junior college. That you'd go to junior college to to solve, you know, a uh, you know a, an immediate issue, um, you know, to buy some time. You may have a young player who's going to be really good, but isn't ready, you know, from game one. Um, and for us, that that's that's kind of been our approach. So I think depth is is the most important thing that you can do. Um, you better have a starter that you feel really good about. You better have a backup that you think you can win Big Ten games with. Um, and you better have a, a young, exciting guy develop them at every single position, and that may force you to move some guys uh, to spots that that they, you know, maybe weren't weren't thinking about playing. Um, you know, kind of like we did with Jesse Lucetta last year. Um, but but you better have that, you know, because this is obviously a, a challenging game, maybe one of the most competitive games in in, in college athletics. Um, and week to week, you better be ready, especially in our conference and specifically on our side of the conference. So uh, develop in that depth. Uh, and then part of developing that depth is playing, guys. One of the things that we talked about on the retreat um, is, is not, being, not being led by ego, right? You know, um, you know you're, you're up 35 nothing in a game. And I'm on the headset, say, hey, we need to we need to sub out and get our backups in. And whether it's the defense coordinator or offense coordinator, someone says, well, I just want to get one more drive. There's still plenty of time in the fourth quarter. Um, but a lot of times you're doing that because you want to preserve the shutout. And I want the shutout as much as anybody. But what's more valuable, the shutout? or getting those guys in there and letting them play valuable minutes and gaining experience. On top of that, you know, again, under the new model, the guys want to feel like they're being developed and having an opportunity to play. That's where out-of-conference scheduling is, is, is as important as it's ever been. Um, so all those things factor in, but I, I think back, you know, we had some opportunities last year to get some guys in to play earlier in some games, and we didn't. And sometimes, you know, you, you, okay, you were about to make that change, but the drive went longer than you thought and ate up more time off the clock for the defense or the offense. Um, but maybe if we would have done that earlier in the year last year, maybe we would have been more prepared uh, when the time came when it was needed. And that could have been preparing guys for a bigger role or being able to evaluate guys and say they can or can't do it, you know, and, and somebody else maybe needs an opportunity. All those things kind of factor into it. So that was a big discussion uh, this offseason with the staff about we got to be willing. Because the other thing is it's not just the experience, right? Uh, it's, a late game in, it's a late game injury when the game was pretty much decided already. Or, you know, the targeting penalty. You know, and now you get a guy with a targeting penalty late, late in the game, and now he misses the first half of the next game. So all those things factor into it. Last question, Pat. I actually oh, got it, Chris. Tyler, sorry. Yeah. Um, hey, James, hope you're doing well. Hey, you too, Tyler. Um, Salim Wormley and Adiza Isaac, you seem to be optimistic about their status coming out of spring ball, where they stood. I know they were still a little limited. How did that carry over through the remainder of the offseason, and, and where are they both in kind of their pursuit of getting back there for game days and playing big roles? Yeah, I think you guys remember, you know, Adisa and Sal, there was a lot of excitement about them last year. I mean, you think about how many guys uh, last year that, that we lost um, either before the season or during the season um, that were significant leaders and players from a production standpoint. For a Sal, uh, there was a lot of buzz about Sal and how well he was playing. It's funny, I was saying, I think it was last night or two nights ago in the quarterback meeting, um, about how how well Sal's playing, and Sean, you know, quickly reminded me, you know, that we said the same thing last year, you know, right before the season, bef before we lost him. So, having him back is significant. You know, obviously, having Adisa Isaac back, uh, I think everybody, you know, that covers Penn State football, you know, closely uh, or as a fan or, or a member of our program. Uh, was really excited about what Adisa was was going to be able to do, you know, last year after gaining experience the year before. 
uh, having PJ back, you know, having Sean back, having Tig back, having these guys back, um, as well as the guys that we lost for whatever reason. Um, it gives us a really good balance of, of maturity and experience and, and young talent uh, that hopefully we can, you know, we can learn from each other and, and play off of each other to start out uh, on the road uh, with, a, with a really challenging game on the road. I went over with the team about you know, Purdue's success in night games and blackout games and, and things like that. So making sure we have a healthy respect for our opponent and to start the season with a Big Ten game on the road, uh, uh, you know, is going to be important. So that those, those guys' leadership and having those guys back uh, is really important, and we need to continue to build on it. Thank you very much, Coach.